I'm going to be uh, your, uh, your speaker for the first uh, three minutes before we go on to the keynotes and while we wait for the other people to arrive. A couple of short announcements. So uh, the first thing, we're going to be launching HITB Jobs today. HITB Jobs is basically a new portal, a new recruitment company, which was being put together by HITB in order to promote people who have hands-on experience. In the true fashion of HITB, we're moving away from certifications and university degrees, and we're focusing on bringing people into the workplace who have hands-on experience. You have four beautiful women standing outside here who are going to be able to guide you through this. Um, they're also available for pictures, so please feel free. HITB Lab is uh, coming on again, proudly sponsored by our friends at IBM. We've also got uh, HITB Lab is actually, if you go to the good looking girls and then you go two doors down, HITB Lab is going to be there. CTF, Weapons of Mass Destruction, looks beautiful this year. Some of the best new uh, features that I've seen, a wonderful graphical display. They, again, are located directly next to the good-looking girls. We then have Ham Radio Village. Um, uh, these guys have basically come in from the Malaysian Amateur Radio Emergency Services and will, weather permitting, try and create a link between here and the space station for you to be able to talk to some astronauts. We also then have the kind people from Tool who have come back in in order to show you guys how to pick the most advanced locks. Now, that's about it for, uh, for the announcements. I am very, very uh, pleased that uh, Joe actually said to me that he'd like to introduce himself. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Joe, a.k.a. Kingpin. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. How's it going, everybody? I got to get my water that was knocked over. Good catch, by the way, David. All right. My name is Joe Grand, and um, I'm here to talk with you guys today about hardware hacking and uh, why hardware hacking is um, so cool and why it's sort of becoming this up-and-coming uh, area of computer security and um, sort of been the underdog for a long time, but it's near and dear to my heart, and it's something that, that I'll, I'll go through. Uh, so my name is Joe Grand. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer, hardware hacker, inventor. Um, I've been involved in, in the, uh, the hacker community for a very, very long time, um, longer than I, uh, I wish to admit. Um, I'm actually really old. And uh, let's see, I've been involved in electronics since I was about seven, and hardware has always been my thing. While everybody else is kind of uh, playing around with software and network applications, I've always been a hardware guy. I've loved to tinker with hardware, to open it up, um, see how it works, design projects. I originally started reading um, like Nuts and Volts magazine and, and uh, um, Analog and Antic magazine to, to, to uh, learn all about electronics and just build things hands-on. Because um, I think really the, the hands-on experience of, of working um, with things is really the important thing. So that, that actually ties into the HITB jobs. Is having hands-on experience, um, I think, it is, it is at least as important, if not more important, than the educational uh, background, especially in the computer security industry. Um, in the early 1990s, I was a member of a hacker group called The Loft, which was one of the, the early um, kind of hacker spaces, and there were seven of us that would just hang out in a clubhouse, and we'd hack on hardware, we'd, we'd break windows, we'd set up networks, we'd do all these things. Um, we had a bulletin board system, for those that, that uh, remember modems. Um, and it was just a place to hang out and, and explore technology without the risk of you know, breaking somebody else's system or doing something illegal that could actually throw us in jail. Um, so that was a very important time for me, since I was uh, about 16 when I, when I joined the loft, um, to kind of teach me the whole, uh, or reinforce the hacker mindset, and what you can do as a hacker as opposed to just kind of following the rules, right? It's exploring technology and doing things that had never been done before and kind of kicking the beehive to, to force change um, within the community and w within uh, corporations. Um, more recently, I was a co-host of a television show called Prototype This, on Discovery Channel. Um, it's actually airing right now on Discovery Channel Science in Malaysia, um, and it aired in the United States last year. Uh, if you don't have Discovery Channel Science, um, you could probably go online and find the episodes at, at, at various places, and I encourage you to do so. Um, let's see, as far as uh, um, hardware stuff, I mentioned I grew up 
with electronics, with tinkering with hardware. Um, some security related stuff I've done, uh, USB authentication tokens, PDAs, early PDAs, cell phones. Um, I just, anything security related has uh, um, security related problems and I'll, I'll go through some of that. So basically the, the talk is about um, hardware hacking and hardware um, but also, uh, so I'm gonna go through like the hardware hacking process and then I'm gonna go through an example of one of my favorite hacks and one of the most recent things that I've been involved in. Um, but before we kick this stuff off, um, how many of you guys are, uh, are, are software engineers or involved in, in doing software programming or software uh, analysis? A few, okay. How about on the network side? Network design, network analysis, no? Hardware, you guys all hardware guys? Who does hardware? Who tinkers with electronics or anything? One guy, okay. I think some of you guys aren't telling the truth. <laughs> um, but everybody's involved in the, in the security industry, right? Yeah, okay, I think that's true. All right, so hardware products, technology, we're surrounded by technology. How many people have cell phones? Come on, now you have to raise your hands. Okay. Everybody has cell phones, everybody has laptops. Um, you know, we take technology for granted these days. We use it all the time. Um, every, pretty much every product we use has electronics in it. And if it has electronics in it, it can be tampered with, it can be modified. Um, a lot of times we're using hardware products for, for security related applications. Um, and, and most of the time, most users don't think about the security ramifications of that or what could be done when you tamper with the hardware. Uh, and that's great if you're, if you're a hardware hacker um, like me, going, you know, going in to analyze products and find problems with products and share that information with people. Um, but it's a little harder if you're on the design side, which I'm sure some of you guys are. Um, designing products is hard, especially designing products to be secure is hard. So um, you can take out of this presentation um, either tips about ways to go about the hardware hacking process, um, or you can take out of this presentation things not to do if you're a designer to help make your products more secure. Um, yeah, so, so har hardware has always been overshadowed by the, by the network side of things and by the software side of things in the computer security industry. Um, but more recently, it's making a comeback. And that's why um, HITB wanted me to come here and sort of uh, evangelize, I guess, about hardware and why it's so important that people start looking at hardware products. Because just because it's in a nice black box and it has blinky lights on it doesn't mean it's secure. A lot of times there's a microprocessor in there. It's running some sort of specialized firmware or software. Um, so there's a lot of techniques that even if you're not a hardware guy, you can still go uh, and use some of your software hacking techniques to analyze the product um, and, and, and break things that way. So for those of you that, that don't have any hardware hacking experience, um, why hardware hacking? Uh, these things are sort of the same for you know, whether you're analyzing software or whether you're analyzing networks. Um, it could be a, applied across the whole, the whole range, but security competency, you know, testing hardware products for security uh, and to, to see how secure they are if you're gonna deploy them in an infrastructure. Uh, consumer protection, I don't trust the glossy marketing materials when you go to like a security expo and, and you have somebody, some salesperson handing out materials saying, our product is the most secure. We had the smartest guys uh, working in a secret laboratory creating these um, cryptographic, you know, our own cryptographic routines and all this stuff. Um, don't trust that. You know, you need to go and actually verify that, especially if your name is on the line when you're recommending the product to somebody or you're um, implementing that product. You really need to test and make sure. Uh, and, and then what I like to do is let the public know, um, whether that's through an advisory or through a talk um, or through the media. Sometimes using the media is very useful. Um, so, so consumer protection is very important in the hacker community. Military intelligence, if you're from the military side, um, analyzing hardware that might be encountered in the field that somebody else is using and you find and go, who, you know, what is this thing? Who designed this? Doing forensic analysis essentially against hardware, against electronics. Because every electronics designer has their own uh, way of designing products. So you could look at, say, an IED that somebody picks up on the side of the road. You could look at the trigger circuitry and say, oh, okay, now, I sort of recognize how those circuits were connected or what components were used or where the components were purchased. That looks like this group. Or, oh yeah, you know, this, this was done a little bit different, that might be this other group. Because I can look at boards designed by people I know and I can tell which one's which. 
Um, education and curiosity sort of encompasses the rest of the, the hacker ethic is you do it because it's fun, you do it because you can learn something. Uh, even if you're hacking a piece of hardware, you know, with no reason, you just want to do it, you're going to learn skills, you're going to learn things you can put in your toolkit to use uh, in the real world when the time comes. And then of course you have the flip side where there's good, there's always bad and I wanted to include these because these are some of the common things that you'll see um, from a more malicious side of hardware hacking. So if you're a designer, you might want to be aware of these to protect yourself. Um, theft of service, obviously anything that costs money, people are going to want to get for free. Um, so uh, I'll actually show you um, an example of that. Competition or cloning, um, everybody wants to make products cheaper. So uh, some companies exist specifically to reverse engineer products, figure out how they work, and then remanufacture them, for example. User authentication, spoofing, getting access to uh, networks, um, forging users' identity. Those are sort of the main three, but there's, I'm sure, all sorts of other reasons why you would wanna, why you'd wanna break hardware. Um, so why is hardware hacking becoming this new thing? It's been around, electronics have been around for a long time, software has been around for a long time, computers have been around for a long time, but more recently, a lot of people are starting to hack hardware, and I think that's very, very good. Because I've been giving talks on secure hardware for 10 years, and a lot of the stuff that I talked about 10 years ago is still valid. Problems still exist. The same classes of problems um, as far as uh, retrieving contents from memory, replay attacks, all these things that as a computer security professional you go, oh man, I can't believe people still do that. But in the hardware space, people still do that. Um, so we can take advantage of that, but a lot more people are getting involved um, for, for a few reasons. One of them is easy access to tools. Um, you know, some of this equipment, oscilloscope, a good soldering iron, used to cost a lot of money. Um, mostly academics would have the tools or um, hobbyists with a lot of money, but now they can be purchased for a few dollars anywhere in the world. You can have your soldering iron, your multimeter, your oscilloscope. Those are like the three core tools, all you need to start analyzing hardware. Um, so the, the entry level is a lot easier. Um, even more so possibly than software. You know, if you're actually buying the, uh, the debugging tools you need or the development tools you need for software, it could get a lot more expensive now than hardware products. Um, components, you can go anywhere. Um, uh, let's see, with the place around here, Jalan Passar, that street, went there yesterday. All sorts of electronic components. You can just go and get what you need. It's not that hard anymore. Um, logic Analyzer, there's some open source solutions like the Bus Pirate when you want to start monitoring digital signals and seeing what's actually going on on the lines. Um, so you could build something for, I don't know, 20 US dollars to do what you need. Then you have things that are a little more advanced and I'll get into a detail of this later. Um, chip decapping and die analysis is sort of the next step of hardware hacking uh, where you're looking at the actual um, integrated circuit die, the silicon die inside of the, the black integrated circuit packages on a board, um, which sounds really complicated and uh, it, it definitely requires different skills than the higher level hardware hacking, but the tools are available now and they used to be millions and millions of dollars, um, but now you can get the equipment that you need to perform these tasks uh, on the surplus market um, through friends. I have a few links uh, in a section later on about people that will do this stuff. You, you could pay 50 bucks to have a chip decapped and have the, uh, have the die imaged for you. Um, so even though, even if you don't have the skills, you don't have the tools, you can outsource them to somebody that does, um, which is uh, a, a new concept that, that wasn't possible five or 10 years ago. People just wouldn't outsource their services to do chip decapping and die analysis for 50 bucks. Um, but if, even if you don't have those tools, you can go low tech if you still want to go down that route. And that's why people are starting to get into this. Um, acetone, fuming nitric acid, a microscope, you know, just the basic tools and you can, you can start going. PC board design is another thing that nowadays is accessible to all sorts of people. These design tools, professional design tools, would cost 25,000 US dollars, um, which only a handful of people would actually buy, right? That's a lot of money. You really need to, you know, if you're gonna invest that kind of money, you better know you're gonna make that money back. Um, but now there's all sorts of low cost solutions, open source, some of them are free. Um, that can get you in the game. You can start designing your own circuit boards, which means now, instead of trying to hand wire everything, you can use the latest technologies. You can use the latest fine pitch um, surface mount parts. You can create kits and then distribute those to your friends or sell those to your friends and, and 
and get the tools out there a lot easier than 10 years ago when you drew all your schematics in ASCII art and tried to tell your friends about how to build it. Now you can basically give them a key.